and welcome to Church at Home. We're just so thankful that you chose to worship with us today. So go ahead and grab a cup of coffee, get cozy, bring your family and friends, and let's hear from God's Word today and let's worship the King of Kings. We hope that you have a great day and we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Good morning, church. Welcome. It's good to see all of your smiling faces. Come on. Oh, thanks. Go ahead and make your way on in and stand up where you are. We're going to start some uh, worship. Always a great way to start the day, in my opinion. Nothing better than uh, turning your, your voice and your body and your thoughts and your words all on focus to Jesus, right? And uh, also, happy April, heading into Easter just around the corner. Anybody else excited about that? Yeah. Woo! All right, I'm going to pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you that we can be here together this morning. Thank you for what you've done and what we get to celebrate in your name. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your worth. King over all the universe, to you be the glory. And I am alive because I'm alive in you. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ covers me and raises this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. you be the glory, maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your worth, king of all the universe, to you be the glory, oh, and I'm alive because I'm alive in you, and it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ covers me and raises dead men's life. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. And every sunrise sings your praise. The universe cries out your praise. I'm singing freedom all my days now that I'm alive. And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ covers me and raised this dead man's Life. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive I'm alive Amen Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, when your streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. 
Blessed be your name when found in the desert place. Walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, of this pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. Give and take away. My heart will choose to say. Blessed be. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. There in the 
the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness lay then bursting forth in glorious day all from the grave he commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand It is well, it is well. 
that it is well with our souls because of what you've done for us. We love you, Jesus. May you be honored and glorified in this day and in this time. Amen. Can I have a seat? This morning we want to share in the Lord's Supper together. And uh, I want to read from Luke uh, for our reference this morning. I'm going to invite our elders uh, to come, if you will, at this time to begin helping me serve. And as I'm reading the scripture, go ahead and once everyone's assembled, pass it out for everybody. A lot of times when we read through the scripture, we are using the reference in Corinthians. Today I'd like to use Luke instead. Luke chapter 22, verse 14 through 20. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table. Now, of course, in Jewish times or in Middle Eastern areas, their tables were really short. They're about six inches off the ground and they usually sat around him in tables and the concept was the meal was the activity but the focus was the relationship. Focus was always the relationship. The meals were secondary to the focus and that was the relationship of those that were there. And so they reclined at the table and the apostles were with him. And he said to them, I have earnest earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and gave thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some of the bread and gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. We have open communion at our church and and that being said, it simply means this. If you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to join with us in this communion. You don't have to be a member or even a regular attender, but if you love Jesus Christ, that's what is required. Years later, when Paul added to the um, account, he uh, added this component to it about examining ourselves, And now I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 to 31. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak or sick, and many sleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. Paul added that just as a point of doing retrospect, looking within ourselves to make sure our hearts are right with God. And no one can look at your heart but you and God. And so this morning, as we receive this communion, I want to just take a moment, have you bow your heads, shut your eyes, and make this prayer. God, search me like David of old. Search me. Search my heart. Is there anything there that I need you to forgive? And just take that moment and search your heart and seek God's forgiveness if there is. If not, we just are ready to receive this gift of God. We take these emblems in our hand. And Jesus, we thank you today. We thank you for the bread that represents your broken, broken body for us, that by your stripes we are healed. 
We thank you for this cup that represents the shed blood of Christ on the cross. And, and by that shed blood on the cross, we are forgiven. And Father, these represent those great events to the church. And we receive them now. Having looked at our heart, making sure there's nothing inside us that would prevent us from receiving what you have given. And we say thank you, Jesus, for this communion supper that we partake together. In Jesus' name, amen. Join with me, the bread and the juice. Bless you, God. Bless you, God. Thank you, Lord, for that provision of the cross and of your stripes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And everybody says, Amen. We believe in prayer and we believe in healing. And this morning, we have a special need we want to pray for. And uh, I'm going to have a prayer for healing today. I'm praying for uh, Steve in the back. And, and um, uh, he has a need of God to touch him physically. And we want to pray that God would touch his body. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand with me. Now, there may be some here today that just need a physical touch of God. If so, just lean up to the person next to you and say, hey, pray with me. And we're going to pray. And we're going to pray for Steve specifically that God would touch him. I'm actually going to journey. I have a headset and I can do that. And I'm going to walk on back to Steve and I'm going to pray with Steve. We all know what it's like to face obstacles and struggles and just needing a touch of God. Jesus, I pray right now for Steve. God, I pray that you touch him, touch his body, you who created him. You made him wonderfully. And God, right now, I pray the touch of God would be on him. From the top of his head to the sole of his feet. God, I pray you be his source. Lord, I pray for his heart. Lord, that it would be sold to you. I pray for his physical being, that he would trust you with it. And God, our lives are in your hand. They are. And with that, we trust you. Job of old, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And God, we put ourselves in that place right now. And God, I pray you touch him in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you. You may be seated. As the Holy Spirit reminds you this week, pray for him. And uh, ask God to touch him. Thank you, Steve, for being with us today. Thank you. I'm going to invite at this time Rebecca to come up to the front. And she's going to share a little bit about uh, the program the kids have been involved in the last year it's been or last week it's been pretty impressive or last month i'll get it out hey there my, my name is Pastor Rebecca. I'm the kids pastor here at First Assembly, and I want to just give you an update on, I, I came to you about a month ago, and I told you that we were going to be doing this March Missions Madness in our kids department, and, and we introduced BGMC to you, so if you don't remember what that is, I'm going to tell you again. BGMC is, means Boys and Girls uh, Missionary Challenge, and basically what BGMC does is it equips kids to know, to care, to pray, to give, and to reach the lost with a heart of compassion. And so each week in the month of March, we sent our kids home with our little buddy barrels. And I'm sure most of you have seen it. If you were a parent, it has gone home with you, and it has come back and has made several trips in the last month back and forth, being filled and emptied and filled and emptied. And so I want to thank you for all of those uh, donations and, and helping your kids to fill those buddy barrels. But each week we presented a different organization that BGMC supports. The first week we talked about Convoy of Hope. It is this big food truck and organization who uh, loads up semis full of food and supplies and takes it all across the world. 
Um, and right now, the Convoy of Hope is, is traveling to and from the Ukraine to make sure that they have the supplies that, that they need. This is one of the many um, services that BJMC supports when, we, when the kids give their money in those little buddy barrels. Uh, and so we presented in different need each week, and we asked the kids to respond with compassion. And every single week, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the very first, I said, you know, hey, kids, do you think that we can collect so much change that it equals $200? Now, that's a lot of change. Uh, and even I was skeptical, I have to admit, like change, like lost coins for lost souls, right? And I was thinking, well, that's a lot of change, right? Um, and yet then it came in. And, and the first, you know, the first time that I counted the, the money at the end of the very first week was $68 in change. And I thought, well, this is great, right? And then the next week, we, we talked about um, the uh, special services. Uh, it's called blind services. So we talked about uh, this service that helps uh, churches to equip um, themselves to help special needs. So kids and families and people who have special needs, whether it be blind or deaf services or autistic services so that they can equip their churches to like help all, all kids and uh, to learn about Jesus right where they are. And more money came in. And then we decided, man, do you think that we could have $300 by the end of March? And they kept bringing their buddy barrels, bringing their buddy barrels, story after story of kids who were not only saving or taking money from their savings, but doing odd jobs around the house uh, to collect money. I even heard of many stories of teeth being lost and money being given from the tooth fairy to support BGMC. And, uh, and then even more, you know, kids were like, you know what, I have this money and I'm just going to spend it on candy, so I might as well give it to kids who need it. And so then more. We just started giving more and more and more. And now we're up to 200, now we're up to 300. And I say to the kids, do you think that we can have collect $400 by the month of March. And they were like, yes, right? So we had a little boy come in last week with his $100 bill from his savings. And he was so excited to give it that he couldn't wait until Wednesday. And usually on Sundays, he skis with his dad. And he just couldn't wait not to give it. So he did not go to the Bluewood Bash, which is a big deal with your skier, right? And he came on last Sunday to bring his $100 into this, into our offering. And we had many and many and many more stories just like that. I had one student who brought their buddy barrel to their daycare and asked the daycare providers, can you help me fill my, bu my buddy barrel? And, uh, and two times she brought that thing full, right? So, okay. So then we talked about the um, African Oasis Project, which is this project that helps build wells in Africa so that people can have clean water, access to clean water. And we walked on down to the creek and, um, and we showed them dirty water from the creek. And I said, would you drink this? And they said, no, we wouldn't drink it. We would get sick, right? And, I, and so I began to teach the kids about how this heart of compassion to give out of themselves to help other people, not just in our community, but all across the world. And more money came in. And you guys, you will be astonished when I tell you the amount of money that the kids gave. This is not adult giving. This is beyond the children's families. I did not ask you for any money. This is coins and cash. Are you ready to know how much we, because it is way beyond $200, and it is way beyond $300, and it is way beyond $400. Are you ready? Because I want you guys to like really cheer because this is a big deal. This is what, this is what happens when kids have a heart of compassion to move into missions, and this is what it looks like. Okay, all right, show us. $609, like isn't that amazing? $609 of giving, and what this does is it helps to equip people around the world, share the gospel of Jesus, that's what pushes the gospel forward, but it also instills a heart of compassion in your kids, and we tell me that we need more kids into this next generation who are taking less selfies and have more compassion in their hearts to help others, right? Yeah, and so when you see your kids, would you just, would you tell them, hey, that is so amazing what you did for the people around the world that you are just opening your heart to compassion because it is way easy for kids to show compassion. Like they are just ready to give of themselves. They are ready to give when there is a need presented. And I just want to challenge you to be the kind of people who have the heart of compassion as well, to give when there's a need, even if it's across the street or around the corner from you or somewhere where you can show compassion. Uh, man, every single penny Every single drop of compassion that each one of us doles out during the day or during the week is making a huge difference, huge kim, uh, kingdom impact. So thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. All the kids, first kids can now leave with uh, Pastor Rebecca as you head to the back for first kids. We appreciate that. And it's kind of fun 
you don't really see Rebecca up front here a lot because she's always exiting out the back door with the kids. So thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, kids, for your incredible giving. What are cultural values that you hold and employ in life? What are some things that you hold as a cultural value? And I know there's a lot of them. We have family traditions that we hold, and we have liberty and justice and truth, and these are all values that are important to us. And as a church, First Assembly, we have values that we hold true and things that we really stand on. And one of them is our mission statement. Uh, mission statement says, teach truth and live love. Those are values. Those are things we believe in that really become cornerstone to who we are. We believe in generosity. Many Sundays we receive an offering and, and uh, whether it's online giving or in the black box in the back or in a bucket that looks like a KFC bucket that is passed around, we believe in giving because we believe in generosity, such as Rebecca just talked about. We serve at the pleasure of the Lord. I believe that is a call of God. It's a value that we have. When God calls, we, we answer. Our doors are open to everybody. And I want everyone to always be welcome to come into the church of the house of God, the church. To be free to walk in and receive from God. I believe we need to be a friendly place, a, a, a place of friendship, if I could put it like that. And in fact, that's where I really want to focus my message on this morning. As we begin the first of a three-week series called Disconnected. Disconnected. It's my little dot up on the wall. My little yellow dot disconnected. Friendship empowers us. It helps hold us accountable in our lives. It allows us to be honest with our hurts and our feelings. Friendship is valuable. Friendship is incredible. A few weeks back, Jill and I had the privilege of going on vacation to the big island of Hawaii, and we stayed in the city of Kona. I'd never been to Hawaii before. This is my first trip ever to go there. It was a great vacation, great vacation. We hiked a total of six miles one day to see the green sand beach. You should be impressed with that. We hiked six miles one day. We walked among the sea turtles. We watched the lava flow. We drank some great Kona coffee. That Sunday we were there, we attended a church called King's Kona. It's a new church started about three years ago and very young in personality, wonderful worship. And, and we fit in with a new part of the family of God of Hawaii. Fit right in, part of the family of God. One of the things that made this vacation enjoyable for us was doing it with good friends. Jane Kim Norman. Now, Jill and I, if we went by ourselves, we would have had a wonderful time and we would have enjoyed it greatly. But having good friends to share it with made it that much more enjoyable. Friendship. Now, Jay and I have been really best friends since I was 13 years old and Jay was 12. When I met him that first time in Beaver Bay, Minnesota in July of that summer, and, and uh, since then we've traveled the world together. Friendship is valuable. Friendship is valuable. Jesus called his disciples friends. He gave them the label of friends. In fact, if you look all through the New Testament, the only time we see Jesus weep was at the death of a friend, Lazarus. Only time. In fact, John chapter 11, 35. Here's the verse. Jesus wept. That's it. Shortest verse in the Bible. You've now memorized a verse today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Jesus wept. Why? Because a friend of his had died. It's a picture of friendship. Loss of a friend is difficult. When friendships break down, it's hurtful. The closer the friend, the greater the hurt, isn't it? It's true. John 11, 11 says this. This he said, and after he said to them, our friend, and in, in the Greek terminology, it would be our dear, our close friend, not just friend as an acquaintance, but our dear, close friend, Lazarus, has fallen asleep. He has died. But I go so that I may awaken him out of death or out of sleep. Now, the tomb of Lazarus, 
tomb of Lazarus is located in a tiny village uh, of Bethany. And at present, Bethany is owned by the Palestinians. And between Bethany and Jerusalem, there's a wall that separates them. They're only a mile and a half apart, these two communities. But there's a wall that separates them. The wall was actually built by the Israelis. But the wall separates them. Now, years ago, when Christ would have been there, I'm sure he walked that journey many, many times over the years. But now there's a division. There's a separation. And, and that fence or that wall is designed to separate. We don't have a lot of details about Lazarus as an individual or what his involvement or ministry in this team of disciples in Christ really was. We don't really know what that story looks like. But we do know Lazarus was considered a friend of Jesus and of the disciples, both. Because when Jesus addresses it, he says, our friend, not my friend, but our friend Lazarus has died. To destroy or lose friendship is a disconnection. It's when two things become disconnected. As a individual, we have to have friends. When we become disconnected, it's always painful. There's a hurt that comes with it. Now, a lot of times when we look at the person of Christ, we look at the, we look at the div divinity side of Jesus. His preaching, his healing power, his miracles, his resurrection. We look at that aspect of Christ, but Jesus was fully human, the Bible tells us. And he had friends, just like you and I would have friends. And close friends, that's part of being a human being. That's part of how we're created, to have friendships. To have these relationships. St. Teresa from Calcutta made this statement. Make friends. Friends are a lifeline to happiness. Sometimes friends will disappoint. Sometimes friends will break your heart. Make friends anyway. Isn't that good? Many times throughout life we have this happen where we get disconnected in close friendships. And the older we get, the more hard it is to become friends with new people. Because friendships take investment. They take time. And if I have a good friendship that breaks apart, I'm really reluctant to start a new friendship. Because I know the investment that was there in the first one. I believe this is why many people, even in church, get hurt so deeply. Because in church, we invest our, not just our emotion, we invest our heart into church. And when I get hurt in church, and I walk away from the body of Christ, that hurts hard to get over, isn't it? Because it's a deep felt hurt. And the older I get, the more difficult it is to make friends because the less time I have to invest. The last couple of weeks, Jonathan has had messages that dealt with forgiveness. And although it's never easy, forgiveness, both given and received, is imperative to life. Friendships are valuable. And there's a word I use a a couple months ago called stick to itness. Stick to itness. And sometimes that's an important word in, in our relationship and our friendship with others. Now, let me just, again, sometimes I have to say this. I have to preface this. We're not having division in our church. <laughs> there, are no, there are no divisions that I'm re referencing today. It's just the text, okay? Please understand. Smile at me. Oh, good, it's kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, it's just the text I'm referencing. And if it hits home, that's a good thing. When Jill and I were rebuilding the Bible college in Latvia, I mean, I had, I had, stepped, on, I had stepped out of the accepted lines of organizational structure in the Assemblies of God Mission Department as any missionary in their history in this Bible college. Everything we did was by faith without permission. I spent money I didn't have. I bought buildings I didn't have a right to build. I hired lawyers I shouldn't have hired because I felt God said to do it. And so I had put everything in my heart on this building. 
in the getting of the building, I had it, but I had to rebuild it. I had to restructure it. It's uh, 100 feet wide and 50 feet, uh, 150 feet long. I mean, it's just a massive building, three floors tall. And I have to rebuild this thing. I'm ripping out walls and ripping out floors and ripping out pipes and ripping out bathrooms. And it was a mess. And I hired people from the bishop's church, the, the flagship church of the nation of Latvia that I worked with. I hired 12, 13, 14 people from his church to do this labor. And they came five, six, seven days in a row. They were there. It was a mess in that building. And I had a problem. It was a big problem. It was an ethical problem with these workers. And I met with them one day. And I challenged them in what they were doing. And I said, I need you to put your heart into this. Now, I know these people. I saw them every week. I went to that church. The church is a block away from my home. It would be what we consider our home church if I wasn't traveling. I know these men. I see them in the pew. I preach to these men. And now I have them gathered around. I'm saying, here's the thing. I need your heart to be here. Your work ethic has not been strong. And I need you to either put everything you have into this or tomorrow morning, don't come back. Next morning came around. Only one returned. Everybody quit. From the bishop's church, they quit the American. You talk about low points. I was devastated. I had everything tied into this building. The one who came back was named Yvonne. Yvonne came at the right time. He worked. He worked all day long. He worked hard. He is about 64 years of age. He just got in there and kept working. We finished up everything that we did. I hired different people. We got it done. I hired Yvonne full time to work in our furnace department, our furnace room. And months later, months later, I walked into the room and Yvonne was such a great guy. Some mornings he'd be there at 5, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'd walk by his room if I was there early, and he'd be in that room just praying. His hands would be up in the air. He's all by himself, and he'd be praying for the students and praying for the staff and praying for the churches, and I liked Yvonne. And I walked into his room. I said, Yvonne, I have a question for you. He said, what? I said, when all your friends... All your church partners that you sat with for years in church, when they all quit and didn't come back, you did. Why? Why did you come back? I'll never forget what Yvonne said. God told me to work. God did not tell me to quit. Pretty powerful, isn't it? God calls us to serve. God calls us to be friends. God calls us to love. God calls us to forgive. God never tells us not to try. God never calls us to quit. Thank you. You know, I like swimming. I'm not a great swimmer. I kind of swim like a rock swims. But I do realize if I want to have fun in the pool... I've got to jump in with both feet. Now, if I stand on the outside and I put my tip of my toe in that water, I'm going to have a lot of second guessing. Do I really want to do this? But it's only until I make a 100% commitment do I realize the enjoyment that comes when I'm finally in the water and I'm having fun playing with other people. That sounded bad, didn't it? When I'm finally in the water and I'm splashing around, and all of a sudden, I realize the joy that comes with that saw, that action of jumping in both feet. Mark chapter 14, verse 10, is really my text for this morning. Then Judas Iscariot, now, we don't know much about Judas Iscariot. I have done researches on him. I've talked to some of my colleagues, some of my friends that are theologians, and 
And uh, I've asked them about Judas Iscariot and the information they would have or research they've done. And why did Jesus choose him? He's not even from the region of the other disciples. And, and most Bible historians simply believe Judas Iscariot was a um, political uh, zealot. He fought for political causes. And for whatever reason, he joined in this cause for Christ who was establishing a kingdom. And he wanted to fight for a king and a kingdom. And many scholars believe when he finally realized that the kingdom Jesus was building was eternal and not temporal, not on earth, he lost interest and he wanted to get the money and run and find a different cause in which he could then fight for. So Judas Iscariot, who was the one of the twelve, went off to the chief priest in order to betray him. Now this is a friend of Christ. Someone that would be considered the friend. I look at Luke 22, 47 through 49 and verse 54. While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and one called Judas, one of the twelve, was uh, preceding preceding them and he approached Jesus and he kissed him and Jesus said Judas you're portraying the son of man with a kiss and then all those around him saw what was happening they said Lord shall we strike with the sword and having arrested Christ they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest and Peter followed afar off and then not long after that all the disciples fled and they separated themselves from Christ he lost his friendships he lost those that were his friends. There's something sad about losing your friends. Those who leave you. Sometimes it takes years or even a lifetime to see the purpose of God in an action or an event. In 1921, 1921, many great things happened. Insulin was developed. 1921. Tomb of the Unknown Soldier was dedicated by Harding. Our president. Babe Ruth hit 59 home runs in a year. Set a record. And the very, very, very important pop-up toaster was invented. 1921. But did you know that a great miracle seed was planted that year? 1921. A miracle that would change the eternal course of more than 110 thousand people in the year when people were cheering on sports greats like Babe Ruth or scientists discovering life-changing medicines an ordinary missionary couple named David and Sven Flood one with their two-year-old boy from Sweden to the heart of Africa as missionaries one day there, they met up with another couple, the Ericsons, that came from Scandinavian co uh, country, and, and together the four of these adults and the children sought God for direction. And this small team of four adults, I think in and of itself was a miracle. You know, in missions, and Rebecca referenced missions today, in missions, you don't always get to choose those you work with. You inherit them. I didn't get to choose any of my missionary colleagues. I had 27 missionaries that worked along with Jill and I, and I served as their leader. And I didn't choose one of them. They were given to me by the Assemblies of God in missions. And so you really develop an ability to adjust to all different personality types. And, and uh, uh, it's not always the easiest, but that's how missions works. Fellowship and friendship is developed from that. And, and the Ericsons and the Floods were this type of new family dynamic. Friendships that had to be forged from nothing. And sometimes the, even the simple common denominator for these friendships is as basic as homesickness. You're all homesick because you're in a different culture. And you're the same culture and so you draw together because of it. After praying together, these two couples felt they heard from the Lord to go to an area outside of the main mission station. 
Now, the mission station in that area of Congo would be a place where they would be safe and provided for, and they could go out during the daytime and minister and come back at night and be in that, that compound and a place of safety, convenient for this mission life. And, but they felt to take the gospel to a remote area of Africa where there were no missionaries and where no missionaries had ever gone, and they ventured out. I stayed in a compound once in a troubled country, and I'll tell you what, I felt pretty safe in that compound. In the middle of torn and poverty-stricken place, it felt pretty safe, but they chose to go to a remote area outside of their compound. Once they got to the village they wanted to go to, the tribal chief of the village said, we don't want you here. I don't want you in my village because you're Christian. And I don't want your Christianity to come into my village and affect any of the other gods we worship. You cannot stay here. So they went further out into the jungle. Out into the jungle where no one had ever gone from their mission fellowship before. And, and there they set up their huts. They built them from scratch by themselves and lived in the jungle where they felt God calling them to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jill and I have some amazing God moments in our missionary journey. Life preserved where there should have been death, but I can't even imagine what these two couples would have gone through. I don't know about you, but I don't do well in jungles. I don't like bugs. I don't like snakes. I don't like things I can't even describe. And there you're living you're not just living there. You're creating your own space. Wow. Once there, they establish their new dwellings. And they simply begin to pray for a spiritual breakthrough. Anything, anything. But nothing happened. Revival did not come. Blind eyes were not opened. Lazarus was not raised from the dead. The only contact they had with the village was a young boy. The chief let go to see them twice a week to bring eggs and chickens. That was it. So once or twice a week, this young boy would walk out to the village or walk out to the little huts where these couples, these couples were living. And it was not the dream of revival that they had when they started. How can God do anything with such a limitation? How could God do anything? Seva Flood, she's a tiny woman, four foot, eight inches tall. Four foot, eight inches tall. She decided that if this is the only African person I'm going to meet, he's going to become my mission field. And so every time that boy would come to their huts, she would share with him Christ and his love and salvation and tell him different stories from the Bible. Small miracles can happen in small packages. Big miracles can happen in small packages. And one day, this little boy prayed for Jesus to become his Lord, accepted Christ as his Savior. Always remember, we start with what we have, and faith allows us to trust God as we move forward with that. There were no other encouragements. In fact, malaria affected them greatly, and finally the Ericsons decided, we've had enough of this. We're going back to the compound. And they left the floods all alone. David and Seva's floods remained there, determined to go it alone. We're determined we're going to see this through. But now their friends have gone. There's that disconnect. That friendship is gone. Maybe in a small way they understood how Jesus felt when his disciples left him. His friends left him. Then of all things, Seva found herself expecting in the middle of the jungle, in the middle of all this loneliness. And it came time for her to give birth. The rest of the story I'm going to tell next week. Come back. Take one of our touch cards. I'll do a really short recap and I'll continue it next week. It's pretty impressive. I'll tell you what. Great story. Matthew 26, 56. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scripture of the prophets. Then all the disciples fled him and left. And Jesus is all alone. That night of loss would have been difficult to say the least. His disciples, his friends left him. 
and he stood on his own. Even when we feel we're on our own, Jesus is there. Even when we feel people have walked away from us, Jesus, the friend of sinners, is there. In calling of his disciples, Jesus was a friend of, their, of the sinners. And forgiving the woman caught in adultery, Jesus was a friend of the sinner. This morning, if you're in need of that forgiveness, Jesus is your friend, and he forgives. There's a TV series called The West Wing. Some of you may remember it. Leo McGarvey, the president's chief of staff, told this story one day on the show. A guy's walking down the street, falls into a hole. The walls are too steep for him to climb out. A doctor walks by. And the guy shouts, hey, doc, can you help me get out of my hole? The doctor writes a prescription, tosses it down to him. A minister walks by. The guy shouts, hey, preacher, can you help me out of this hole? The minister jots on the prayer and tosses it down to him. A friend walks by. A guy shouts, hey, friend, can you help me out? The friend immediately jumps down into the hole. The guy says, are you crazy? Now we're both in here. His friend says, yeah, but I've been here before. I know how to get out. The ray of light, that simple dot, that little ray of light, the round circle of sun representing Christ shining into our mess, into our heart, into our fear, into our sin, gives comfort, light, and forgiveness. And Jesus says to us clearly, emphatically, page by page, the Gospels, I know the way out. Follow me and I will set you free. Jesus is my friend. He's been in my rut before. He took my sins on the cross. We celebrated that this morning. He died and rose again for me. Today, right now, he stands beside us. He stands around us. He's everywhere. He's here. He's within you. And if you don't know him this morning, Jesus will be speaking to you right now. While your heads are bowed, let me just give these words. No one looking around. Jesus would be saying to you, I have been there. I took all the sins for everyone. I'm here to be your friend, to forgive your sins, and to give you eternal life. Take my hand, accept my salvation. And that's Jesus' call to you. While your heads remain bowed, John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you to do. What does Jesus command us to do? But to follow after him. To accept him as our Lord and Savior. While your eyes are shut and your heads are bowed, if you're here this morning and you need Jesus, you need Jesus to forgive your sins, Jesus, to be your friend, to jump in the hole that you're in and to help you out. Just between you, me, and God, I want you to raise your hand. I need Jesus. Thank you. Someone else. I need Jesus. Anyone else? Wait just a moment. I need, thank you, that forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else, anyone else, just wait a moment. I need Jesus. I need him as my friend. Just slip your hand up. Let me see it. Head still bowed. As I pray right now, I want you to make this prayer your own. Make this your prayer. Pray it in your own words to God. And the prayer is just, Jesus, forgive my sins. Forgive my sin. I need you. 
I need you to come into my life, into my heart, and to be my Lord. And I want to walk with you, friend with friend. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Make that your prayer as I pray right now. Jesus, thank you for being our friend. And I know the value of friendships. I know when there's a division of friendships and the hurt that you feel. And I know you lost your friends as you were taken captive that night and brought to the cross. And all your friends ran from you. You know what it feels like to stand alone. And yet, Lord, today, because of that great work on the cross, because of that ray of light that shined into the darkness, you've become our friend. Except you're so much better than an earthly friend. You forgive my sin. You live within me. You bring me your peace and your joy. You never leave me. You walk beside me. That wherever I am, there you are. God, I thank you for this powerful friendship of Christ. Lord, I pray for those who raise their hand today that they would have said that prayer in their own words to invite you in as their Lord and Savior. God help us. God help us. Lord, I pray before we even leave today, we'll connect with someone else and just share with them, I made that prayer today so that we can rejoice with them and encourage them. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank for each person I sit beside, the ones in front, the ones behind. Thank you for your body. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. You know, it's really easy for us to connect together. All you have to do is follow us on our Facebook page. You can follow the links below to give online, or you can stop by the office. Come and see us. We have this special gift for you, the Word of God for today. It's an easy daily devotional that will help you uh, to connect with God in a really awesome way. So have a great day, and we hope to see you back soon. Bye-bye.